Welcome to the re-air of Search the Scriptures Daily, a radio ministry of the Berean Call with T.A. McMahon and the late founder of the Berean Call, Dave Hunt. I'm Gary Carmichael. This week, we are continuing the multi-part series based on Dave's Harvest House book, In Defense of the Faith, published in 1996, with this installment entitled, Is the Bible Written for Everyone? Now, along with Dave Hunt, here's T.A. McMahon. Thanks, Gary. You're listening to Search the Scriptures Daily, a program in which we encourage everyone who desires to know God's truth to look to God's Word for all that is essential for salvation and living one's life in a way that is pleasing to Him. And Dave, I want to open this segment of our program by quoting a highly respected evangelical, Dr. R.A. Torrey, who headed the Moody Bible Institute in the early 1900s and also pastored the Church of the Open Door in Los Angeles before his death in 1928. This quote's taken from your book, In Defense of the Faith, and it's found in the beginning of chapter 5 on page 112. Every careful student and every thoughtful reader of the Bible finds that the words of the Apostle Peter concerning the Scriptures that there are some things in them hard to be understood, and that's 2 Peter 3.16, are abundantly true. Who of us has not found things in the Bible that have puzzled us? Yes, that in our early Christian experience have led us to question whether the Bible was, after all, the Word of God. We find some things in the Bible which it seems impossible to reconcile with other things in the Bible. We find some things which seem incompatible with the thought that the whole Bible is of divine origin and absolutely inerrant. The Bible is a revelation of the mind and will and character and being of an infinitely great, perfectly wise, and absolutely holy God. But the revelation is to finite beings who are imperfect in knowledge and who are also imperfect in character and consequently in spiritual discernment. There must then, from the very necessities of the case, be difficulties in such revelation from such a source made to such persons. When the finite try to understand the infinite, there is bound to be difficulty. Mm. It is not wise to attempt to conceal the fact that these difficulties exist. It is part of wisdom as well as of honesty to frankly face them and consider them. Dave, I certainly agree with what Dr. Tory is saying. I guess I'd put my emphasis more that although we're finite beings, if we were perfectly finite or perfect in our finiteness and we didn't have sin nature, God could make it completely clear to us. He could design something that finite beings could understand fully, but we're not. We're, we're, we have a sin nature, <laughs> even if he lays it out as simply as and straightforward as it possibly could be. We'd blow it somehow, ourself, our wills. have problems with it. Yeah, Tom, for myself, I think maybe Dr. Torrey was speaking rhetorically. I've never found anything in the Bible that caused me to question whether it was God's Word. Now, I found some things in the Bible that puzzled me Mm -hmm. for a short time until I really investigated. But I could give you puzzles. I talk to God about it all the time. Lord... You've always been. You always are. How is that possible? I mean, just the character of God, Mm -hmm. that God exists. We know he must exist. We've been through that a number of times. You can't get everything out of nothing. There was a time when nothing, all things wear out. Second law of thermodynamics, there was a time when there were no things. But you can't get things out of nothing. There had to be someone. We're driven to this conclusion. Mm -hmm. But to comprehend a God who always is, not only always has been, he just always is, that's beyond me. I say, God, how'd you get to be God? And then, of course, I know that that's a ridiculous question. It's beyond me. And, of course, God is trying to open our hearts to an understanding of himself. In fact, he wants us to know him, and this is what his word is about, God is revealing himself to us. So there would be things 
that are difficult, as Peter says, hard to be understood. But Peter adds this, he says, which they that are unlearned and unstable Mm -hmm. twist as they do the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So, well, that's what this book in defense of the faith is about, because as we've mentioned, I have files of this sort of thing, and Mm -hmm. I've gone through them. I've tried to find some of the toughest questions that the skeptics and critics have asked. But also what he refers to, that's what this program's about. (laughs) The B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. We Mm -hmm. want people to have a heart for God's Word. Where Mm -hmm. else are they going to find truth? As we've said many times on this program, if we don't have a source of truth, of God's specific revelation to us, then we're left with our best guesses. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's all wild speculation. No matter how good it sounds or how it makes us feel or whatever, it's just... It's your opinion against my opinion, Dave, or thousands of others who we could fit in this room. Yeah. Of course, we couldn't get thousands of people uh, in here. <laughs> we get about two or three. But Right. Yeah. yeah, well, Tom, the Word of God is true, and you can check it out. You can test it. You can examine it. And if it isn't, if we have not heard from God, and we've said this many times, then forget it. Mm-hmm. Shut down the seminary. Shut down the churches. Shut down the universities, for that matter, because there's no purpose or meaning. We wouldn't have a clue as to why we're here, how we got here, and so forth. So God has revealed himself to us, and he's revealed himself in his word and his Mm -hmm. purpose and plan for our lives. But there are those who have sincere questions, and there definitely, as Dr. Torrey said, there are definitely things in the Bible that seem to be confusing, seem to be contradictory, and uh, that's what we are trying to discuss here. And encourage diligence in searching Mm -hmm. the word out, wrestling with these things. But let's go for our first question here. Why didn't Jesus, if he really rose from the dead, show himself openly to the rabbis and to the common Jews and to the Romans? Wouldn't that have established once and for all the fact that he had come back from the grave? And would not such a public appearance of Christ have converted the entire world of the day to Christianity? The fact that even the Bible admits he didn't do so is presumptive evidence against the alleged resurrection, is it not? If he really was alive, why didn't he prove it openly? That's a good question. Tough question. A lot of people ask it. Well, why wouldn't he? Well, the basic assumption behind this question is that everyone has an honest heart, that everyone really wants to know God, Mm -hmm. and everyone is open to the truth. If you can just show it to me, I remember when I was in the business world, and I don't know if they have such things now, but some people, I saw it on a number of desks, the little sign that says, don't confuse me with facts, my mind is made up. Mm-hmm. So this questioner is assuming that no one thinks that way, that if Jesus just showed that he had risen from the dead, everyone would believe. That's one of the basic underlying problems with much of the charismatic movement. They think that what we need are signs and wonders. This is what John Wimber thought, signs and wonders movement. If we can just show people signs and wonders, then everyone will believe. Well, again, as we've mentioned it before, no one saw such signs and wonders as the children of Israel, they're called, in the Bible. Talk about the Red Sea opening in front of you. Mm -hmm. God speaking with an audible voice from Mount Sinai. Manna comes every day. Right. Well, just that one the Red Sea parts, they wow. cross the other side, and immediately they put together a golden calf to worship. It, so, God. Right. In fact, the rabbis, the Pharisees, had plenty of evidence. They knew, for example, that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And that was what? Just weeks earlier? A few days, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There were witnesses who told them about this, and that was why they said, we got to kill him. We can't have him doing this. In fact, they were even going to kill Lazarus because Jesus had raised him from the dead. Talk about hard hearts just because there was proof. You know, even among those 500 to whom Christ appeared at one time, you remember, went out on a mountain in Galilee and there he appeared to them. It says some of them doubted. (laughs) There is no way that just evidence, facts, can convince anyone of spiritual truth, Mm -hmm. of the truth of God, of the gospel, and so forth. 
It takes the work of the Holy Spirit. I believe that the Holy Spirit desires to do that work in every human Uh heart. But what about the will in this, Dave? Isn't that a part of it? We talked about that the last time, John 7, 17. If any man wills to do God's will, he will know. Whosoever will may come, Jesus says. This is not like Islam where they hold a sword over your throat, will take your head off unless you confess there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Where they have the power to do that. Right. In Indonesia and various other places, Sudan, of course. No, God is not trying to trick us. He's not trying to force us into anything. He wants our heart. So Mm -hmm. the scripture says, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized, Mm -hmm. Philip tells the Ethiopian. So, you know, there were people who saw Jesus. What about the Roman guard over the tomb? Well, right. I mean, the Roman guards, they sure knew that Jesus was not there anymore. And they had even seen an angel roll the stone away. And they ran to tell the Pharisees, the rabbis, he's alive. Look what happened. We were scared to death, frozen in fear. And the Pharisees must have believed them because they offered them a bribe. To to change the story. Right, to tell the lie. Mm -hmm. They weren't going down to that empty tomb and prove that Jesus was still there. So, Tom, the fact is, evidence alone would not do it. Mm -hmm. Why would he waste his time? Jesus was following, in fact, what he had said to the disciples. Don't cast your pearls before swine. I'm willing to discuss. Paul, I'll talk all night with someone who is sincere, who has sincere doubts. Mm -hmm. But when I find out that all they want to do is argue, they're just trying to find some chink in the armor of a Christian. They are determined. They're not out for truth. They don't want to know the facts. But they are somehow going to prove the Bible isn't true. Tom, I don't have any more time for them. And Jesus would have been wasting his time, number one. Mm -hmm. It would not have changed the minds of the rabbis, even some of his disciples doubted. Now, they had further evidence, of course. Overwhelming evidence, Dave. And that's kind of a point that I want to address here. On the one hand, we're saying that there are people, no matter what the evidence is, don't confuse me with facts, as Mm -hmm. you said earlier, they're never going to believe no matter what. But evidence is a good thing. Much of what we do in this program, things that we've addressed, your book. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was an overwhelming amount of evidence. There's an overwhelming amount of evidence for anyone today, and I don't know whether we get into that in this particular book, but we've dealt with it in talks and other books. Simon Greenleaf, of course, you remember, he was co-founder of the Harvard School of Law, Graduate School of Law, was challenged, he was an agnostic, was challenged by some students to investigate the claims of Jesus, and he did so. We may have talked about that even recently. Many Mm -hmm. lawyers have examined it. A terrific book. I don't think it's in print anymore. A Lawyer Examines the Bible. And in that book, Erwin Linton, the author says, look, any lawyer that wants to examine the evidence, he's going to have to come to the conclusion that this is true. And that was what Simon Greenleaf said. So we have evidence today. One of the great evidences, of course, is in the transformation in the disciples. They were Mm -hmm. cowards. They were afraid. They all fled to save their own skin. And when they thought Jesus was the Messiah at that point, they still thought he was the Messiah. And then you're telling me that when they now know he's dead and in the grave, they somehow get the courage to steal his body and hide it in Peter's basement or somewhere, you know. And then, According to the Passover plot. Yeah. Other myths. And then tell this lie, and then they're willing to die for a lie. Nobody is fool enough to do that. Suddenly they have the courage to stand there before the Jews who had crucified him, who had cried away with him, and tell them that he was alive and that Peter has the courage. Acts 4, 12, neither is there salvation in any other. He tells the rabbis, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. These cowards suddenly got the courage to testify to the resurrection because they had stolen the body and made the whole story up. You cannot escape that. And Paul, of course, is one of the great evidences. Not only did he turn from 
being a persecutor to become a Christian, knowing that he would be persecuted. And you could say, well, that doesn't prove that he really saw Jesus, and indeed it doesn't. He could have hallucinated. Maybe it was a goat complex or something. But he now corrects Peter, and he becomes the chief apostle. But the other apostles who studied under Jesus for a number of years, they have to acknowledge that Paul, this former Saul of Tarsus, he knows everything they know and more. And he becomes the great authority who writes most of the of New the Testament. New Testament. You cannot deny this man met Jesus of Nazareth. And when you read his words in Galatians chapter 1, I certify you, brethren. I'm a CPA. I know what that means. You better be careful. If you certify something, it better be true. I certify you, brethren, the gospel that I preach is not of man. I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. I didn't consult Peter and James and John, I didn't go up and say, hey, guys, I think I'd like to preach this gospel. But didn't check with the magisterium? No, no, he got it straight from the resurrected Lord. There's just no way you can explain these things away. There's no mm -hmm. other explanation except Jesus Christ rose mm -hmm. from the dead. David, as you're talking, I was thinking about another example of overwhelming evidence. I don't want to belabor this, but you know, we've talked in this program many times about the creation evolution controversy. Yeah. And you find people with PhDs, with an, mm. the ability, the skills, the, the intellect, all of that, and they can't recognize design. Let's not say they can't. They can, but they won't recognize a creator behind design that's so far above anything we can even comprehend. Tom, when I was in university, I guess I had a course or two on that. I majored in math but we took some of these other general courses as well. I can remember disputing with the evolution teacher, come on, guys, you can't be serious about this. You're going to tell me that an eye began with an irritation on the skin and over uh, how many millions of years it somehow developed all the rods and cones and the nerve connections to the brain, and I mean, incredible, the lens and everything, and that all developed by chance over a period of time when it wouldn't help this creature or these creatures survive until it worked. Now, how are you going to develop this thing, find the intricacies of this, and it doesn't work yet, but it somehow helps them survive, and it's all moving in the right direction. Tom, I'm sorry, I do get a bit angry. <laughs> no rational person can think that. But listen, we live here in Bend. Our little newspaper, the Bend Bulletin, when was it, about a month ago, had a terrific... Well, they have some good scientific stuff in there. They don't make it up themselves. They get it from some other source, and they're quoting it. But this was quoting top... I don't know if you remember the article. Mm -hmm. is quoting top scientists who deal with lenses and so forth, and they had just discovered that some particular species of starfish has several thousand eyes all throughout its body, and they have, each eye has a lens that they said is 10 times beyond anything we've been able to come up with. And we are studying the design of this lens to improve our lenses. Now you got several thousand eyes, so lenses all developed by chance simultaneously and somehow all got out, oh, Tom, there is no way any rational person can honestly believe in evolution, that it all happened by mm -hmm. chance. It couldn't possibly. Yeah. See, again, David comes back to the will. They just are rejecting what is so obvious because what happens when you have to come face to face with the idea that there is a creator, that there is someone that you will have to stand before, and it has to be Submitting to his will. That's, uh... That's what's appealing about the Star Wars Force. It's impersonal. It won't hold you morally accountable. It doesn't make laws and make you obey them, or there are consequences if you don't obey them. Mm -hmm. So, Dave, just to finish off on this question, 
Certainly there were lots of things. We could sit here and discuss things that we think Jesus could have done and how he may have worked this way and that way, but he did everything perfectly. This is according to his will, his design. And as we said, somebody writing this question is looking for one item, something that's going to work effectively for everything. But Jesus gave them far more than this person yeah. really understands. And Tom, it's not just a matter of the will, beyond the will. It's a matter of pride. It would be very humbling for the great evolutionists with their PhDs and their honors and the books they've written and their university courses and so forth. They've gone so far out on that limb. It would be just very humbling to admit, hey, guys, it's wrong. We were wrong. It's also very humbling to mankind to admit there is a God who is greater than they are, and they're accountable to him. And morally, if there is really a day of reckoning, we don't want that. Tom, you're, how many, 15 years younger than I am or something like that, I don't remember. You were more part of the... I still have trouble keeping up with you. Yeah, right. (laughs) I don't know what that speaks to. You were more part of that hippie generation or that time of life. I used Mm -hmm. to minister to them. I used to get up to the free speech platform in Berkeley and visit the mustard seed, the Messiah that had that health food store down at Telegraph Avenue and so forth. But you were part of this thing. And what were they all about? We're going to do our own thing. Sure. We're going to get control of our lives, and we can do it. We can do what we want to do. Well, that's man's problem. That was Satan's problem, Lucifer. I will be what I want to be. Well, it puts a damper on that. When you face up to the fact that there is a God, the creator of the universe, and he created us, he created us for a purpose. And if we miss his plan— If we do not find what he made us for, Mm -hmm. we have missed everything that the creator wanted. We've missed the whole purpose and meaning of our lives. But we're going to have to submit to his will. We're going to have to allow him to reveal his will to us. And we're going to have to be willing to do it. Now, Tom, just uh, I know we're out of time, but who would not want God's will? Isn't he smarter than we are? Doesn't he really love us? I mean, there is so much beyond what we could imagine that God would have for us, even in this life, much less the life to come, if we would allow him to have his way. Mm -hmm. Dave, you talk about the years back. I can remember, yeah, I was a sort of a bourgeois hippie. I didn't go the whole nine yards, but everybody seemed to be seeking and searching after truth. But when it all came down to something, there was never a truth to find. It was always a relative thing. Mm -hmm. And that's really a crime. When somebody sincerely seeks after truth, God has got it available. He has it out there for those who will seek after him. Mm -hmm. Amen. You've been listening to the re-air of Search the Scriptures Daily with T.A. McMahon, a radio ministry of the Berean Call please visit our website, thebereancall.org, to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to thebereancall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is thebereancall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our ebooks are free. I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. Until then, we encourage you to search the scriptures 24 7. Though none go with me, I still will follow, no turning back, no turning back.